Okay, now we're going to start talking about cell anatomy and the organelles in this chapter, this section. So let's first talk about the history of the cell. So the cells have been around for a long time. The first guy to actually label the cell was Robert Hooke. And Robert Hooke was actually looking at cork cells under this microscope, and he looked at it, this, this slice of cork, and he said, well, look at all these little boxes. They remind me of the cells in a monastery where all the monks sleep. So he called them cells, little chambers. And, of course, that was the early days. And nowadays we know all kinds of functions are going into the cell. We can see that, you know, under an electron microscope, all the magnific magnificent little things that are going on all the time. Right? Some important things to remember, and again, when we're going through this, I'm going to color code some really significant things. If it's in red, you absolutely better know what it is. So anything that's in red, if you go through and just memorize everything that's in red, you'll probably pass the class because I, if you memorize everything in red, I can almost guarantee you're going to get at least a C. Everything that's in red, you have to know. If you remember all the red things and all the green things, you're probably going to get an A. The green are the significant points that you really have to understand or get. You kind of have to remember them. But if you're just looking to skirt by, just remember the red. So these are the things you absolutely have to walk out of this class with. I also put other things in here that are in, in like a gold color. And the gold is usually what I put in extra credit. Do you really get it? Do you understand what's going on? They're more the fine details. And there's some things I don't necessarily put in gold, but maybe I just bold them or I, I really point them out. So listen for emphasis. What you want to get out of this class is how much time you're going to is dependent on what, how much time you put into it. If you're just wearing, looking to skirt by and just get the basics of anatomy, watch the red. They're the main point. If you're looking to get a really good grade in the class and you really need to take this on for your career beyond here, you need to watch the reds and the greens. And if you really want to be a smart cookie and be you know at the top of the class and, and uh, you're looking at this for a deep profession, something you really want to go deep into and you're going to have to use for the rest of your life, you want to know the reds, the greens, and the golds. So kind of watch the pattern. But the first thing I've talked about before, the cells are the smallest living units of, of life, actually. So the smallest living units in our bodies. Even a virus, when it gets in your body, is not alive. And we'll talk about that over and over again later. But right now, cells. All right, organelles are the components inside the cell. They're like the organs for the cell. You have organs that carry out specific functions in your body, and organelles carry out specific functions inside of the cell. The cell can't live without its organelles. In fact, we'll talk about something called a red blood cell. And a red blood cell doesn't have any organelles, which means it's limited. It has a limited lifespan. It can't repair itself. It can't fix itself. It can't replicate. So once it's there, it's committed to uh, die within a certain amount of time. All right. So a little more of the introduction to the cell. I just talked about Robert Hooke. In the old days, anatomists would actually kill the specimen. They'd put it out on a slide, a real thin layer, and then they would put dyes on it to stain it, shine some light through it, and then label those parts. That's the good old days when we killed it and threw it in the trash. Right? Nowadays, physiologists really want to know more about what's going on inside the cell. So physiologists, we've actually developed these special fluorescent um, microscopes or fluorescent uh, procedures that we use with microscopes where we can actually put chemicals or little tiny probes or markers inside the cell while it's still alive, these probes or markers will stick to whatever we want to target. So if we want to look at something like a, uh, the cytoskeleton, we can label it and we can see where all the cytoskeletal elements are. If we want to look at the mitochondria, we can label those and see exactly where the, the mitochondria are. If we want to look at for, for some specific gene expression or some kind of protein that's made by the cell, we can label that one protein. So we keep the cell alive and look at it. And what's kind of cool is that it looks like a, a regular uh, light microscope, but will actually shine a laser through at a high frequency. It bounces off and activates those little chemicals. So, um, like in this example, it's actually called a total internal reflection fluorescence microscope, where we'll bounce the laser light off of this, activate these colors, we'll take a little snapshot, and we know exactly what's going on. The benefit to these is that, well, we can see things in three-dimensional for one thing. Another thing is that we can see specific organelles or specific structures that are inside of there while the, the cell is still alive. So these are really cool procedures that we can, we can do nowadays. Okay. Another thing you might want to check out is this, how big is a cell? So we're going to talk about cells and I'll use some measurements like in micrometers and maybe we'll talk about um, a red blood cell being seven micrometers. And what's really the significance of that? Take some time Click on this link or go to this link, and it's cool because you can actually see a coffee bean and a, a grain of rice, and you can zoom all the way into the size of a cell and a bacteria and a virus, even all the way down to an atom so you can get a comparison to size. 
Right. So cells, again, the smallest unit of life, and all life is composed of cells. Right. Some life is simple, and it only has one cell, like a bacteria, but you're not simple. You're multicellular. You're this big organism where all the cells depend on all the other cells working. You start killing off groups of cells, they all start failing. It's like they're all holding hands and depending on each other, and if you break the chain or you, you kill one group of it, they all fall down together. So some of the common cell functions you have to get familiar with, and I put them in green because you really need to know these, are that all cells are like you. They have the same functions you do. For instance, they have to be able to move around. When you're going through embryological development and you start with this one stem cell, it replicates and it starts moving around. All these cells move around in certain locations to become specific parts of your body. Another thing is that they conduct. Right? All cells are capable of electrical conductivity. So they basically create a battery-like charge and they can use that for electricity. We'll talk about that in better detail. Um, your brain's the same way. You think with electrical conduction. If I hooked up electrodes to your head, I could measure about 10, um, well, about 10 watts. I, I, I joke when I say this because 10 watts is about how bright your, your light bulb in your refrigerator is, but sometimes I kind of wonder if, if some people could barely even light up a Christmas tree bulb. I'm just teasing. I don't think anybody's that dumb or has that little electricity. I just sometimes think people don't use it completely. But everybody's brain is, almost everybody's brain is capable of creating lots of this electricity. It's because of the conductivity. You do the same thing. Number three, metabolic absorption. Cells need to eat just like you need to eat. They digest, they convert that food, lipids, carbs, and fats into, I said that twice, so this lipids, carbs, and proteins into energy forms. And we'll talk about that energy called ATP. All right, secretion. They need to secrete things to, to basically talk to their environment. They secrete to tell their neighbors what's going on, to uh, identify where they are in the environment. Like, we'll talk about autocrine and paracrine chemicals. Autocrine is when they talk to themselves. I mean, all great minds, they talk to us ourselves, right? So just like people, we need to talk to ourselves. Paracrine means we talk to our neighbors, right? Hormones are a, a type of chemical that talks over long distances, and we'll talk about that. Uh, excretion. You eat food, you have to get rid of it. Okay. Same with the cell. It brings in food, gets rid of waste products. Respiration, it breathes just like you do. You bring oxygen. You blow out CO2. The cell does the same thing in your body. It brings in oxygen, uses it to make energy, and then blows out the carbon dioxide gas. Reproduction. Cells reproduce. Okay. Cells also have a limited lifetime. So they reproduce and reproduce. Think of skin cells. They're constantly reproducing, but they're also dying at the same time. The same as us. We reproduce and then we die. All right? Um, hopefully not that quickly, right? Reproducing. All right, we choke. And then the last one, communicate. We need to be able to talk, and cells need to be able to talk to tell their neighbors what's going on. And I really look at cells as being like, like a tiny version of a human being. We have these social environments. We have these you know, large environments that we live in that we all have to get along and work together well. There's cell diversity. You have 100 trillion of these cells in your body. They're talking to each other, communicating with each other but they're all from the exact same stem cell. You came from one stem cell. One of dad's sperm, one of mom's eggs meet together. We form this new stem cell, and then all the cells in your body came from that. All of your genes in your body are the same, whether it's a neuron inside your brain or a muscle cell in your arm. So we all have the same genetic, or all our cells have the same genetics inside of us, but what we do is we go through this process called differentiation. They differentiate. They still have the same genetics in them, but they have a different purpose, so they're differentiated. There are actually about 200 different types of cells that have specific purposes. We're going to group them together into four general categories called connective, epithelial, muscle, and nervous cells. And so these are the general purpose, and we'll go through them in better detail. But you can see the different appearance of cells, like a sperm cell has this long tail for swimming. You have muscle cells in their special shape. You can see the fibers that are going to them give it function. You can see a neuron that has this long structure, so it's basically like a telephone line and sends communication a long ways. Epithelial cells that have this puzzle shape so that they can start stacking together and form this long sheet. And even red blood cells, they're just nice and round. They're round because they have a, they have a, um, a special function of diffusing oxygen and CO2. They have this nice round shape so that they have um, ideal surface area for diffusion. We'll talk about these concepts later, so I don't really want to get into it too much, but you see, all these cells have different shapes because they have different functions. Let's look at a generic cell. 
this you absolutely have to memorize. I know I didn't put everything in here in red, but you're just going to have to know it. And as we go into individual slides, I'll put them in red and specifically point out what you need to know. But this is a generic picture of a cell. And here you can see the outer membrane around the cell. Here you can see all the organelles or structures on the inside. Here you can see um, the main center where you keep all the bl blueprints for life. Right? So here's the big picture. I've always imagined this as being like a gooey, squishy little thing. And I think science textbooks or biology textbooks have kind of pushed this into my brain. But in reality, as we go through the cells, they have specific shape like we saw with the neuron and the red blood cell and the epithelial cells. But what you're going to have to know through the, this video specifically are what all these different parts are, right? So you should be able to look at an electron microscope picture like this by the end and actually identify some of these structures. So I'll show you, in general, the cartoon version like this, and then I'll show you the specific picture of a cell. So when you look at a big cell like this, some of the first things we'll point out, like the nucleus, this is big, large, round structure in the middle. And I know it's not perfectly round, but you get the idea. And the cartoons can be nice, large, and round. When you look at some of these organelles like mitochondria, you can see the zigzag shape inside of them to give it characteristic. When you look at the centrioles, the centrioles look like a stack of rods. And you can see them here. But you can see some of these um, different features, these characteristics as we go through it. Right? You'll even see the plasma membrane. It's the outer membrane or the outer border of the cell. You can see how it's continuous all the way around. It helps give you identif identity of the cell. Right? So it's important for you to get used to these different types of pictures, whether it's an electron microscope picture or later we'll look at some fluorescent um, microscopy pictures, or whether it's the cartoon, you be able, need to be able to interchange back and forth. And if you have your lab notebook where you're making drawings, as you're going through, make your own drawing. Draw little characteristics that help you identify what these things are, like the zigzag and the mitochondria as we get to it. Now let's talk about the main components of the cell. First is the plasma membrane, and that's the barrier. If you're, if you're using an analogy of this being like a little tiny human, this is the skin of the human. I like to think of it as a big biodome, too. Here's your dome, and this is the dome around the outside of the cell. It's the protective layer that separates the intracellular fluid, which means within the cell fluid, from the extracellular fluid, which is outside the cell. You have to know those terms. Usually we abbreviate ICF for intracellular fluid and ECF for extracellular fluid. So just get used to those terms. Right? These are watery components with a lot of different chemicals floating in it. And you can see, just by the color that we're going to get into, this has different chemicals in it than the outside does. Right? So the plasma membrane separates the internal environment from the external environment. When we look at the internal components, we're going to talk about this big nucleus in here. So it's a large structure. It's one of the first structures you can really identify that we just talked about in the last picture. Right there is huge, gigantic. And then we'll talk about all the components that are in here that aren't the nucleus. Right? So we'll talk about the cytoplasm. Cyto refers to the cell. Plasm is referring to the plasma. Just like in your blood, your plasma is the watery substance with chemicals floating in it. Right? We'll talk about that in better detail, too. Here inside the cell, the cytoplasma, cytoplasm, is the watery substance with all these things floating in it. So we'll talk about the water itself, which is called the cytosol, which means cell solution. And we'll talk about the organelles, which are all these functional structures on the inside. So that's the big picture that you're looking for. Let's start with the plasma membrane. Right? So the plasma membrane, when you're looking at it, there's some keys here. First, it defines the extent of the cell. It defines the outside barrier of the cell. It separates the internal environment from the external. I keep saying that, so it must be really important, right? Another key is that it's selectively permeable. It lets some things pass through, but not everything can pass through. Permeable means that things can move across. Selective means only certain things can move across. So it determines which substances go in and which substances can't go in. Right? Next, we call it the fluid mosaic model. Fluid because it's squishy. It's kind of mobile. It, you know, If you put your fingers together and lock them together, you can do the wave with your fingers. The same with the surface of the plasma membrane. Mosaic because it has patterns to the surface, and we'll talk about what makes up those patterns, but it's almost like a mosaic, like an art piece where you see all these little dots all over. Rearranging the dots gives it different characteristics. It's fluid mosaic. And then the next thing you're going to have to know is the biomolecules, and there are three. Right? It's easy to remember these three major groups. You have lipids, proteins, and carbs. When you eat food, what are the three major groups that you usually look at? The proteins, the carbs, and the fats, right? It's the same idea. You're made up of protein, carbs, and fats. Your cells are made up of protein, carbs, and fats. We're going to go into better detail on these in the upcoming slides. So first, let's look at those biomolecules. 
Again, the three major components are the phospholipid bilayer, so I'm getting more specific with the names. And that phospholipid bilayer, some properties you need to remember are that it's made with phospholipids. Okay, we'll talk about those lipids. It's made with cholesterols inside of it that are embedded in it. And then it's hydrophobic on the inside, which means the inner layer of it, the core of this lipidy membrane across here, is hydro water phobic fearing. It's afraid of water. These things love oils, not waters. Think about it. When you put water and oil together and you shake them up, what do they do? They separate, right? The water stays in one area, the oil stays in another. This core on the inside is oil-loving, which means the water-loving substance stay on the out. Next, the carbohydrates. And the carbohydrates are only about 5%, so they're, you know, of all the components, they're the, the least number. But it's not that they're not significant. They're super important. They make up this covering called the glycocalyx, which is important for recognition. It's like a fingerprint for you, right? So all these things on the outside, these carbohydrates that look like little fibers sticking out, they're carbohydrates. They're sugars, specialized sugars, and we'll talk about it in better detail. And third are the proteins. And the proteins, you know, we used to think lipids were the, the most abundant part because it was fluidy, right? But the proteins, the firm proteins, actually make up the bulk of the membrane. And there are two types. There's peripheral, which means they sit on the periphery, like this, or there's integral, which means they go all the way through. And I'll give you better details as we go along. And again, as we're looking at this plasma membrane, you should be able to look at it an electron microscope slide, or even just a regular uh, image of a, uh, a light microscope picture, and identify some of these parts. So as we're going along, we're looking at the cell, here you can see that barrier on the outside. Here you can see up here too, the barrier going around. So right away, when we're looking at this transmission electron micrograph, or TEM for short, you can see the plasma membrane is this double bilayer. You kind of see that fine line through there where you have the outer layer and the inner layer, right? Then as we go along the outside, you're going to see this glycoprotein coats. And that's the fuzzy layer over here. And the GP, the gold particles, are just for the layer, you know, like marking the surface. So it's insignificant in this picture. But you can see the different layers of the components. Just underneath here, you can see the cytoskeleton, the skeletal elements. And this is a zoomed-in picture where you can see the plasma membrane out here. And then you see all these little tiny microtubules that are part of the skeleton. We're going to go through these in better detail. But I just want to to point out, you can see that barrier on the outside. So the phospholipids, the first part. Phospholipids, when you look at these, they're interesting because they're actually called amphipathic, which I thought was on the slide, but I guess it's on another slide. Amphipathic means that part of them will have water, part of them will have fat. So if you're looking at this molecule, and sometimes you'll see it drawn like this, sometimes you'll just see the components labeled out, sometimes you'll see a cartoon drawing. So I put, these are all pictures you might see of phospholipids. The most common you see in a, like an anatomy and physiology book is this cartoon drawing where you have this round, water-loving lollipop head, and they have the tails poking off the back of it. And these are fat-loving. So what's so special about this is if you drop it in water, part of it loves the water, part of it hates the water. So all the fat-loving parts, the water-fearing, the hydrophobic areas, will stick together. So they form a sheet like this, where you see all these tails, the hydrophobic tails stick together. Here's another sheet, all the hydrophobic tails stick together. Well, since water doesn't like this area, you'll find that these two sheets will actually line up with each other. So the outer part here, water-loving, and the outer part here, water-loving, face the water, but all the fat molecules hide together. It's like they bunch up because they're afraid. They call that the phospholipid bilayer because it forms these two layers. Right? When you look at these names, by the way, Polar means it has a tendency to like water. Nonpolar means it has a tendency to like lipids. Polar means it has a tendency to like things that have charge to it, like positive and negative charge. Nonpolar doesn't. Right? So, for instance, cholesterol is a nonpolar chemical. It likes to hang out in this hydrophobic, this water fearing, lipidy area. Cholesterol is really important because cholesterol, when the cell gets cold, you know, normally cold makes it firm up. Cholesterol keeps it flexible when it gets cold. But at the same time, what's interesting about cholesterol is when it gets hot, the heat has a tendency to cook these, right? It makes them want to fall apart. But cholesterol will actually give it rigidity. It holds it together. Cholesterol is such a cool molecule. The problem is we, get, we give it a bad rap because, you know, you can't have too much cholesterol in your diet because it causes heart disease. Well, you need to have cholesterol for a lot of reasons. And one is to help make this membrane around the outside of your cells. 
all of your cells, whether it's a neuron in your brain or it's a skin cell on the surface of your body. It needs the cholesterols, it needs the phospholipids. So here you see the cholesterols, they embed or they hide in between the different fatty loving tails. Right? It, this hydrophobic core makes it impermeable to water. Water can't slide through this membrane. So if we drop this in water, it would actually form this ball like this. Where water's on the outside, water's on the inside, but water can't go through this membrane. This is, of course, cut apart for your, you know, for your ability to see. But in reality, what happens is that it will form this membrane all the way around the outside and keep the water on the inside, water on the outside, but water can't get through. It's impermeable to water. Next, the permeability depends on a couple things. First is the size of a molecule. If a molecule is really teeny, teeny, tiny, if it's like an oxygen particle or a CO2 particle, it can wiggle, squirm right in between these. CO2, it's nonpolar. Oxygen, it's nonpolar. There's no charge of plus or minus over. So it wiggles its way right through here. Small size can permeate or move through the membrane. Large size, like a big protein, too big and fat, can't squeeze through there. Look at this protein trying to squeeze in, it can't do it, so it just sits on the ed outside edge. Next is its solubility. Solubility is talking about does it love fat or does it love water? If something loves fat, it's soluble and it can move through the membrane. If it loves water, it's insoluble to this membrane, it doesn't move through. Water loving substances can't get through the membrane. And the third thing is it charged. Well, just keep this in mind. Water has a charge. It's, we call it polar. It has a slight positive on one end and a slight negative on the other. Things that have a charge like water. So will things that have a charge easily move through this fat-loving membrane? No. So those are some keys to remember about that, that barrier. Next on the surface, you have carbohydrates. Like I said, it's about 5%. So really it's 1 to 6%, but about 5% carbohydrates. And they're the little branches that sit out here on the surface. The primary key is there for recognition. They're like a fingerprint for the cell. So they make these patterns across the surface of the cell that identify, hey, I'm a human cell. HIV looked for that specific human fingerprint. If it were a cat cell, it'd have a different fingerprint. HIV doesn't like it, doesn't want to live in there. Right? So it's a special pattern, or what we call the glycocalyx, that gives it specific recognition. These carbohydrates... The word glyco is referring to a sugar-like particle. Glyco, glyco. Well, this is a sugar-like particle stuck to a protein, so we call it a glycoprotein. Here's a sugar-like particle stuck to a lipid, so we call it a glycolipid. These are held together by covalent bonds, which are really strong bonds. And I point this out because, well, this outer environment's water. Usually when we think of a sugar and water, we think of it dissolving. Well, this sugar is held so strongly to this protein by a covalent bond that it stays there. We can put the cell in water, and it still holds its same fingerprint. It doesn't change the fingerprint. So it's kind of an important factor that uh, down the road when you get into more complex um, classes like microbiology, and they're talking about the glycocalyx and recognition, how HIV recognizes the glycocalyx, that's super important. For now, you have to know that carbohydrates' main purpose is cell recognition. Here's an example of a glycocalyx. Here we have a cell... Here you can see this dark membrane coming up and then down, and we use back in, up and down. We call these microvilli, and I'll show you them better in detail later. But they're the surface. The glycocalyx is like the sugary substance on the surface, right? So it's almost like this cotton candy or Velcro substance along the surface recognize another cell like it, and they just weave it together. So it's kind of cool how maybe this cell's Bob. This cell is Tom, and they're both the Joneses, right? They recognize that they're both Jones. They're like, hey, what's going on, Bob? Not much, Tom. And they hang out together, right? Their glycocalyx recognize each other. Next, the membrane proteins. And the bulk of what's on the surface of a cell is membrane protein. And you have two types. You have integral, which means they go all the way through. And you have peripheral, which means they sit on the periphery. Most peripheral proteins actually sit on the inside, the cytoplasmic side. So cyto, you know, cell plasma of the water inside. Right? The integral protein is something significant as they're stuck here. We call them amphipathic, which means they have water on one side, fat on the other. They're stuck. They can't move. Why this is so significant for future um, endeavors is that if you want to study these, you actually have to destroy the cell typically. You have to break the cell apart and pull them out. That's the only way to get them out of the cell. These peripheral proteins can actually be plucked off. They can be rearranged. So when a cell moves, it can rearrange these proteins to change its shape, which is kind of cool. 
the integral proteins, and there's acid. So part of them loves water out here and out here. Part of them loves fat in the middle. So they get stuck in here so that the outside surface stays water-loving, inside surface stays fat-loving. Right? Here are some of the key things they make. They make channels. Right? So a channel or a pore means it allows things from outside to get in or inside to get out. It makes a carrier protein. Carrier protein means it's almost like a revolving door. So this carrier protein will grab a hold of something on one side and then flip it over and dump it on the other side. So these are transmembrane. They cross the entire membrane. They're integral, but they go all the way through. Right? Another type is that you have these enzymes. So enzymes, usually what they do is they go all the way through, but they don't actually send anything through. It's a chemical reaction. Something happens here, and it changes activity somewhere else. Right? So usually it's only active on one side. And then receptors are usually something plugs in here. It's almost like a lock and a door. Something plugs in here and it does something somewhere else. Right? So maybe something plugs in here and it opens up a doorway. Right? For instance, maybe there's a receptor here and it would your key would plug in here and it would open this doorway on the other side. So these are integral proteins go all the way through. What were you thinking these were? What are these little things that are stuck in this fatty loving area? Those are cholesterols again. So I'm just kind of pop prison and then you see sugars on the outside. So here's a glycoprotein, where it's sugar on the outside and protein here. And the peripheral proteins typically are sitting on the side as all the side. So you can see the protein here, protein here, protein here, all stuck on the inside. Right? So peripheral proteins bind to the cytoskeleton. They bind on the inside to the skeletal structure on the inside. It's almost like um, holding your skin onto your, uh, well I shouldn't say skin, more like holding your muscles onto your skeleton. And these proteins bind the skeleton and hold things in place. So the cytoskeleton is really important for things like support, giving shape to the cell, or movement. So we're going to see some of these special structures. Let's say here's your cell. You can see in the background. Here you see this projection coming out. Well, this projection is something called a cilium. It might wave the cilium back and forth. Okay? If this projection out here is a flagellum, like on a sperm, this long string, those peripheral proteins can actually help with movement. And we'll talk about this later. Here you can see this long flagella coming out. And all the structures on the inside held together along the inside by these proteins. Right. Here are some of the main purposes of integral proteins. So transporting, work as enzymes, receptors, attaching the cytoskeleton, cell recognition, so one cell bumping into another, and then intracellular joining, locking together. These are circled in yellow, which means that these are something you want to know for future reference, too, but I'm not going to spend a ton of time right now going through them. Just the pieces you need to know, I'll talk about. Now, the characteristic of the proteins, when they form channels or pores, they're specific. They're specific to one type of molecule. Like, for instance, here you see sodium and chloride. They're about the same size, roughly. But they actually form what we call a hydration shell, where they have a special shape. So you can see that this key structure looks different than this key structure. Which means these proteins are specific just to one or the other. So they'll either let sodium go through, or you might have another one that lets chloride go through, but not one that lets both go through. So they're specific. Next, they go through a conformational change. Conformational just means a shape change. So when they open up, they may be locked part of the time, but when they can form or they go through a conformational change, they'll open up and let things move back and forth through it. Next thing you need to know about integral proteins is they can form receptors. Receptors can be sitting on the surface and just open the doorway so things get through. Receptors can be sitting on the surface and create some kind of enzyme reaction. Okay? Receptors can be sitting on the surface and they start a chain reaction. It's almost like here on the surface you have a receptor. You have some chemical that binds to that receptor and it turns on a chain reaction on the inside. It's almost like you putting a key into your ignition, turning your ignition in your car on, and then a chain reaction happens where fuel dumps in, a spark happens, and then you start having this combustion that turns your engine. Okay. So the key here is that proteins can form receptors. When you go into better detail down the road, you're going to find it's contact de dependent. It has to have something that touches it. A receptor has to be turned on by something. right? So it can be the presence of another cell. It can be other chemicals in the environment, whether it's hormones or um, chemicals produced by that cell or by a neighboring cell. Right? Ligand receptors can open channels, right? So the ions 
positively charged things like sodium, potassium, fluoride can move in. Like in this situation, it's the sodium channel that can let sodium move through. Um, it can turn on things on the inside. So these C protein, there's C reactive proteins on the inside are messengers right, that activate signal pathways. And this is a little bit more detailed. And if you want to know more details, just open up the textbook and read about it. Right? Next is they can form enzymes. And enzymes are just proteins that carry out some kind of a chemical reaction. So maybe it's a, an enzyme that forms a pump when energy is exposed to it. Or maybe it's an enzyme that, that changes one chemical to a different chemical. Right? But enzymes activate other things. It's almost like a chain reaction. I flip a switch here and it goes tick, 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 um, subproducts, where it takes a fat and converts fat in something. So there are lots of different mechanisms that can happen. Here are a couple of pictures. These are cool because they're scanning electron microscopes. But in this situation, Shigella, it's a uh, bacteria, gets exposed to the surface of the cell. And what happens is the cell detects that because it has receptors and it starts flipping on all these chemicals to attack the Shigella or kind of block the Shigella, which is really cool. Right? Here's another one where you can see all these little pores Right? So these are little holes zooming in that allow things to go through. They're almost called straws. So a chemical can't just easily pass. It has to have a pore or a straw for it to move through. So it's really cool when you get a chance to look at these things up close. Right? Another thing is that integral proteins can form adhesions. And adhesions sound exactly what they, like what they mean. They're stickiness. The things that hold things together. So here's your membrane in the cell. And on the outside, you have all these structures that are holding on to other parts. Right. Some of these are going to be really important when we talk about tissues later, they're going to be more significant. So around the outside of the cell, we have something called extracellular matrix. Extracellular means outside the cell, and it's a matrix. It's this whole you know, jumble of different components. Things like elastin, which obviously are very elastic, and we'll talk about those. We have things like collagen. Collagen is very strong. It's like a rope-like substance that gives strength to your uh, tissue to hold the cells in place. So we'll talk about a lot of these different chemicals, right? Form cell adhesion molecules, or CAMs. Uh, we'll talk about connections that are actually connecting one cell to another. In fact, I'll show you over the next several slides special junctions. And we're going to talk about these specifically. So gap, tight, desmosomes, and adherins. These are all junctions that hold cells together. Right? So here's an example with two cells. Here's a cell held to another cell, right? Tight junctions are interesting. Tight junctions are waterproofing junctions. They hold one cell to another, and they're almost like um, well, when you have a six-pack of uh, root beer, and that plastic container that goes around the outside that holds the six together, that's like a tight junction. If I poured water across the top of those that six-pack, the water wouldn't go in between the cans, but it would flow around the outside and then over the outside edges. These tight junctions are like Velcro. Okay, They hold things together tightly, they're not very strong. If I pull on them, they rip apart. They're more for waterproofing. Right? Next are the desmosomes. And the desmosomes are really strong. Desmosomes have this strong connective substance that goes in between the cells. It's almost like wire. So you have this long steel cable that goes in between one cell to the next, connecting them. And then on the outside, you have a plaque that's here like glue or cement holding it together. So you can see that this is a strong, strong connection. Things like cardiac cells have a lot of desmosomes because they're constantly pulling when they contract. They're strong. Next are gap junctions. Gap are interesting because they're actually gaps. They're like tubes. So they're made of those connections that I mentioned on the last slide. And they actually form holes that connect one cell to the next one. So if this cell wants a chemical to go to the next one, it can actually release it through the gap junction. These aren't super strong. They're not tight and waterproofing, but they allow one cell to connect or talk to the other one. It connects the cytosol here to the cytosol here. And the last ones are adherin junctions. Adherin junctions are between homotypic cells, which means cells of the same type. Homo is sitting, referring to same, typic is type. So you might find two cells, like two liver cells, that are connected here by adherin junction. But you wouldn't find a skin cell connected to a liver cell by these. So they're specialized junctions. These are four special junctions we'll keep referring to all semester. Here you see another image that's out of some textbooks. So here's one cell, here's another cell. Here you see the ones that have the long, strong fibers with the glue or the cement holding them together. What would that be? That would be a desmosome. 
Here you can see the Velcro-like junctions. They're just like little staples almost holding things together. Those are tight. Here you can see tubes. All right, so those are gap junctions. Here you can see a zoom in on the gap junction where the structure just goes in between. Zoom in on the depth of the zone where you see the long wires and then the concrete plaques. And here you can see how the tight junctions just peel apart like little suction cups or Velcro. So just get familiar with those. And I'm giving you different pictures, um, different perspectives, so you can actually get a chance to see it. Um, just like back here, you can see with this um, cartoonized uh, electron microscope picture the different connections that would hold cells together. Here you see the two cells and the connectors. Here you see close up with them. And then here's just an example of how this comes into play. So there are diseases out there like pemphigoid or pemphigus, where this is a skin. Here you see a lot of skin cells up here. Here you see uh, just beneath the skin cells holding together. Well, well, with pemphigus, what happens is those little desmosomes don't hold together so well. So the cells start pulling apart. If I put any friction, like I rub your foot like this, it'll pull or peel these cells apart and then fluid accumulates in here and it forms that little pocket. So here you can see how the cells just rip apart because tight junctions are holding them together but not desmosomes. So it's interesting when you understand this, how diseases will come into play. And I put a few review slides in here just to keep in mind what you're looking at. So remember we've talked about the plasma membrane. Here are the three major components of the plasma membrane and here are their major functions. So here's a little review slide where you want to go through and see if you can figure out what the different components are. And I'm going to leave you with that. So you can pause right here and figure those out.